Hi, it's Dave. Thanks for tuning in to On the Ledge, the Ontario Politics Podcast. Just before we get to today's episode, if you enjoy On the Ledge, it's likely you'll enjoy our daily offering. It's called Now and Next. And I co-host it with my daughter, Erin Trafford. She's the CEO at Story Studio Network. And we always bring in our producer, Becky Coles, to talk about the stories of the day. And we highlight the daily brief sort of a long look at some of the bigger stories of the day. And you can listen to the entire Daily Brief on our Supercast feed. It's nowandnext.supercast.com. You can subscribe to the feed for 10 bucks a month, and it means two things. First, you get the full Daily Brief on a daily basis. You can hear Now and Next earlier than our regular post, which happens at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we are also setting up some Ask Me Anything sessions. So if you want to know more about how it is we produce the shows or what we're looking at in terms of some of the politics or ideas or whatever it is that's on your mind, because it's an Ask Me Anything session, go to nowandnext.supercast.com and support the show. Now enjoy On The Ledge. An original. From Story Studio Network. Uh, once around the park, James, and don't spare the horses. <laughs> well, here we are. It's Friday, October 14th, as we record this edition of On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast. Welcome in. Dave Trafford here with Keith Leslie, from CH Television, and John Wright from Maru Public Opinion. And, uh, John was just uh, telling us about the latest adventures at Maru. Are you uh, you want to share more of some of those details? Sure, your publicly new announced adventure. Yeah, uh, Maru was actually acquired by a company out of the states, but it's global called Stagwell. Stagwell is headed up by Mark Penn, who started the company decades ago, and his uh, his colleague. Uh, and they they in fact actually started the company with a investment by Steve Bulmer from Microsoft because he was a uh, a client of the firm. Anyways, it's not just polling. It is uh, a portfolio of government relations, advocacy, public affairs, advertising. It's huge. $2.5 billion worth of business. So he's done rather wow. well. But I mean, you right. know him from being the pollster of record for Bill Clinton and a whole bunch of other. Mayor Koch was the first campaign he worked in. So it doesn't do anything to Maru except it widens its uh, bank account so that we can invest in a whole bunch of other things and people at this time and also to have access to their portfolio of clients. So they're really excited about the. It's the platform that we have at Maru. It's a, it's a software platform that allows people to do their own market research. That's what they really is the hidden gem within the company. And you can basically use it at advertising firms and a bunch of other places without us. Like, I mean, you can mm. do your own okay. thing. So that in fact has, uh, is the hidden gem in the, in, in, in the company that they really love. So yeah, we got, we, we got the announcement yesterday, big town hall and underway and it's great. Well, that's, uh, it's nice to hear that in this day and age, there's some level of stability <laughs> in, you know, in the future of work for, for in particular in the case of uh, of Maroon. All right, so last week when we were talking, we left off with the discussion around the education workers. Huh. And I see that the headline, I guess might have been yesterday, a couple of days ago, that uh, Minister Lecce was up in the Lakehead commenting, and the headline was something to the effect that uh, – he thinks that there's a uh, reason for, you know, some optimism around making a deal. But when you read the actual piece, <laughs> the article itself, Keith, I don't know. I mean, it just sounds like sort of boilerplate comments again from the minister. Well, um, he, even, he even opened by saying, well, I'm in a school, so I'm going to be nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he was <laughs> in a third day high school, I believe. Uh, and yeah, it, it was beyond boilerplate to the point of just being really, really polite and not trying to make things any worse at the bargaining table when you have positions that are so, so far apart. Uh, We're talking about the public education workers, about 55,000 of them represented by CUPE, uh, mostly not teachers, the other staff, uh, and and some of them uh, making, you know, they they say $39,000 a year. I believe John pointed out last week that's mostly for part-timers. But uh, for that group in particular, the government is offering a 2% wage increase for everyone else, it's uh, one and a quarter percent. So it's actually above their one percent limit that they've had. Uh, so they're recognizing CUPE traditionally as a lower paid uh, workers in the education sector. 
Uh, but uh, the workers are asking for three and a quarter an hour or 11 and change percent. So that's a pretty far apart situation. Um, I gather QP has never had a full on 55,000 worker strike across the Ontario. Uh, but we could be headed that way. I mean, this absolutely could be the point. Uh, despite the minister's uh, publicly professed optimism, uh, they don't like him much. And, and there doesn't seem to be much of a way of any movement at the bargaining table, at least the unions. They seem to be adhering somewhat to not negotiating through the media, but they're making it very clear there's no progress being made. There's none being made at the table. And how, you know, when you're you know, over 10 percentage points apart, how do you make up that difference? Okay, a couple of things. First, can we just clarify it? Because it's not just QP that they're negotiating with. There's, there's all the major unions right now are are at the table, so to speak, with the with the government, right? Well, they have provincial tables and then uh, local tables, and then they all get together in a later table. So yes, they're in negotiations with them all, but I don't think they've offered the other teachers unions. Uh, that one and a quarter or two percent. I think they're still holding the one percent for them as they are with the nurses and the other public sector workers. I think QP alone is being offered the one and a quarter and the two percent for right. the, the lowest, lowest paid. OK, so, John, you're the numbers guy. And, you know, you you pointed out last week that we're talking about this thirty nine thousand dollar average. And we commented on this a couple of weeks ago. What was the strategy behind that? And did it help? Did it raise awareness and so on? And as I listen back to that, our conversation then, because you brought up the fact that, well, yeah, that's 39,000, except if you take out the part timers, then you're into about 55,000. And I think right there is the flashpoint where all of a sudden it kind of, well, that's it, it. You get to the union playing with numbers more than a little bit. So that's one thing. But to Keith's point about the dollar figure versus the percentage, when you t- say that, you know, we want to give somebody three bucks more an hour. Oh, you know what? That doesn't sound like a lot of money. Then you translate it to a percentage, it's 11%. So all of a sudden it sounds outrageous. You're getting 11%. It's three bucks an hour. (laughs) And you know, it's smart communications, isn't it? Uh, But we've seen this play out so many times over the last number of decades. I mean, Dave Johnson, who was the education minister in Mike Harris's time, was the first one to actually coin a series of phrases and do certain things because you can recall both of you about what the union um, heat was at that time versus the Harris government. But it's basically what we witnessed from the ministers from exactly the same playbook. And it's the following. Uh, We want to be fair and reasonable. That's what we are. It's the whole tone. It's the phraseology. It's we're being fair and reasonable. The next is we're always at the table. We're not going away. We're sitting here waiting for them. And if they don't show up, that's their issue. But we're here to negotiate on behalf of the taxpayers, blah, 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 every single day. And the third thing is, you know, we're open to, to accommodating all these different organizations. But we have to keep in mind that the taxpayer is the bottom line. You know, we're all taxpayers. And, you know, we have to make sure that the government can run effectively, blah, blah, blah. So that that's the square in which he operates. There may be a few things on either side of it. But when I, to your point, Dave, off the top, when I heard him say what he did and I read what he said, I didn't see anything beyond the box. You know, it's just kind of like, you know, we're, I'm here in a school. I'm just going to be polite. I'm just going to say, you know, we're here at the table. We're doing all that sort of stuff. We're not yet into the traction. But I will recall as well that when we did the shows years ago, uh, when there were strikes, when the when the unions were after Stephen Lecce, uh, the union had the, had the upper hand. I mean, the, the, there's no government in my living memory that hasn't had to deal with a union. Doesn't matter what political stripe, they eat them alive. But there have been times when, in fact, if you add up the plurality of people in the province who support the unions, they sometimes move into the majority, and it depends on the tone, oftentimes more than anything else. So I don't. I still think we're in the phony war period. I really do. I think we're we're still in a time when we haven't got down to brass tacks, uh, you know, where we're really in the tight negotiating position. I don't think the government necessarily wants the disruption, but this is a government that, I mean, if it has 40% of people's support on fighting the unions, they'll take that any day. 
Um, they're not going to back down on things. So it'll be very interesting because it's not really the teachers, it's the support workers. And you're right. You know, they're going to come out and say, look, we, we just want a couple of bucks an hour to, you know, well, I think though the, the average listener is, it doesn't, I think we conflate all of those workers together. I think it's easier for us and, you know, on this point, side of the microphones to, to, to look at it and say, well, you know, we're going to parse this and we can split it out. And, you know, so this, it, that's the lane they're in. Here's what I want to ask you though. And against all of this, Teachers in my life do not want to go on strike. Now, I know that there are some teachers who clearly are, are, are happy to do that, but it's probably a minority, despite the overwhelming um, strike vote by the CUPE workers, right? That's their only option. Either you want it or you don't, and it's, it's used as a hammer to hit the nail. I go back to the TTC. Eternally, every couple of years, in September, we would have the threat of a Toronto Transit Commission strike. And, of course, that was back to school and all the chaos and everything else. And we all lived through, Keith, you were at the park. I don't know. How many times were there back-to-work orders for transit workers? Well, the most back-to-work orders issued were always about transit, as I there can you recall. Go. It was right? always about a transit worker union, yes. So so you, when Rob Ford comes along, they decide that they ask uh, you know, the, the province to make it a, an essential service. They do so. Not a freaking peep. And I do not hear anybody saying, oh, as a result of this, we're paying our transit workers a hell of a lot more money because it goes to arbitration and all of that kind of stuff baked in. It's quiet. People are getting what they want. We're moving forward. We're keeping it between the curbs, literally and figuratively, and there's no heat here. The The presence of the union, and I'm not union bashing. I'm just saying the presence of the union in these circumstances becomes an excuse for the government not to come to the table because they 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 vilify the union they don't want to take on the teachers they vilify the union the union becomes the bad guy and all of a sudden we get hung up on all of this bullshit and the threat of closing down schools if they were an essential service we would not be having these problems or conversations and teachers would be paid what they should be paid well yeah, teachers I- already have a pretty good contract for the most part so if it does you know if, if the fear is that they're going to go to arbitration and get so much more I don't see it. No. I, th- I just don't see that that being the big fear. Uh, the teachers or the CUPE union giving their their, their uh, union a 96% uh, strike mandate. Well, what are you in a union for if you don't give them a strike mandate to negotiate? That's just 96% is almost low. I think a lot of unions, you can get up to 98%. I mean, that's what, they're, that's what a strike mandate is for. So your union has some backing when they go to the bargaining table. Nobody wants a strike. I think that's obvious on all sides. But when you're that far apart, it is the one issue you have to really enforce your demand. Taking it away, are you going to make the QP essential workers as well? Because if the QP go on strike, the schools are going to be closed whether the teachers are on strike or not. So is it, are you going to extend this essential worker service as far as the QP workers, the 55,000 of them as well? Whatever Perhaps. it takes to keep the schools open. I mean, if that's the, that's the parameter, the minister keeps saying, we will not close schools. We will not close classrooms. If that is the marching order, then yeah, I think you got to go and look at all of them and say, you're an essential service. We're all done here. Moving on. Perhaps it's something a a liberal government could get away with doing and the unions might be willing to negotiate. Although I will point out when Kathleen Wynne was inside Maple Leaf Gardens winning the liberal leadership, the teachers blocked Carlton Street outside uh, and protest of, you know, not getting enough money. And like a week later, got a half a billion dollars more uh, from the liberal government. So, I mean, you know, that's why the teachers unions tend to like negotiating or working with liberal governments as opposed to conservatives, because conservatives won't bow to that stuff at some point. So if you're right, if they they truly want to keep the schools open, and as the premier said, don't force my hand, I'm begging you, don't go on strike, but don't force my hand. Well, the only alternative to that is essential worker status, I would agree. Well, a few things on that. Number number one, um, there, the negotiation with this particular union sets the stage for the negotiation for all the unions to follow. So if you give three or four percent to one union, you're going to be at the table and they're going to say, we want parity. And so this is actually playing out into a larger game. Number two, I, I don't know how you can live in a civil service or otherwise and be held to, let's say, one percent a year for a decade or whatever length of time it is. I mean, God knows most of us would never work at a company unless we get a good raise and bonus on top of whatever we do have. But to to be held under that kind of, of cap for that period of time, 
also squanders people who want to get into professions and do things. I mean, people just want, why, why would you go there when you could go elsewhere? Thirdly, it's part of a game. I mean, the unions exist for confronting employers. And if you look at the track record on all of these union things that have happened in uh, my lifetime, they've come out ahead. The reason why we say, you know, they're, you know, they've got a very rich pension and they can leave early and they've got benefits and all this sort of stuff is because of the unions and because it doesn't matter in effect what their members say. In fact, we can recall times when members have spoken out against the union leaders, but they've basically gone to the brink and they have ended up with, let's say, that extra 1% when they would have settled for when the government wanted them to settle for less. So there's no back and down because this is the process. It's well known to others. To your point, Dave, I don't know whether or not they'd be ruled essential workers. I don't think the government would go there. I also don't know whether or not that violates the whole idea of collective bargaining. I do listen to what the minister said. I think I heard him say something to the effect of, you know, we have to deal with all kinds of different unions at the time. And I think that's either a signal that they may want to do something more consolidated or they're simply recognizing the fact that one follows the other. But I don't think we're going to see change for a long time in this. And the unions are going to fight tooth and nail every time they get the chance. That's basically what they've done. And they've done pretty, you know, Keith, you can remember back if you go back all these years, they've done pretty well. I mean, they do have lots of, they may not rise well in public opinion, but again, if you ask in public opinion, what do you think of the labor unions? You don't get very good answers. What do you think of your teacher? The answer is pretty good. So, I mean, they're able to play that off between the reputation of your individual teacher versus the union, and and they keep winning every single day that they're, they're at the table. Yeah, I think if that's the, st- and I agree with you, I think that is in fact the, 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 the status in terms of the uh, overall views G- generally families looking at i love the teacher getting a good result whatever that might be um, but at the end of the day we can't if, if we're going to accept this process we can't bitch about the possibility that services are going to be withdrawn I yeah mean, but, we can't. Where I, but well, I, when i was in grade grade 12 in york region in markham district high school we had a i think we had a strike that lasted three months um, the good news out of all of that was that I was failing math at the time. And when we came back, we were all given a pass. Uh, well, here's, the, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, it's, it goes back to the time I was in high school and nothing has changed, but thank God no. they went on strike and I got a pass because I don't think a kid failed that year, any subject because people would have, you know, revolted and blamed it on the teachers. But I, I'm so, so wait a minute. The, 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 the pollster survey yeah. guy w- yeah. was not a mathlete. No, What's no, going no, on? no. And you know what you learn <laughs> later on is that there are real mathletes you depend upon and you have other skill sets. So thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I tell you, here's a w- one way they can find some money for the, the schools uh, and the QP workers, uh, education workers, is uh, get rid of the school boards. I mean, uh, what we've witnessed going on in Oakville in the past month shows school boards really are not serving much of a purpose. Uh, They're just really out of touch with reality. And I think now on all sides of the political spectrum, this started with Mike Harris wanting to abolish school boards at one point. And he took them down to near nothing, I think, and made Mm -hmm. it a volunteer position. Then it crept back up into more and more pay and more and more so on. I think we're at a position again where it needs to be re-examined again. And I think there's broader support for it. And that whole nutty situation with the Oakville shop teacher uh, and the, the board defending this, uh, I think, is a really provable point for a lot of people going, you know what, we could do without the school board. No one knows who they're voting for at school board level anyway. Virtually, no one knows. <clears throat> well, I got a flyer in the in the mailbox the other day from the local trustee, and I know her name because she's forever been the trustee and has been there since, I, I can't remember the, the last time when she wasn't there. So it's got to be about 25 years. I mean, it's a long yeah. time. <laughs> and almost, it's not acclamation, but almost just by how many people even vote for the trustee? Never mind, right? So th- when you start to get around to the number of votes for a trustee who has control over a considerable budget, particularly here in Toronto, what? I oh, man. But you've, you've raised a really important point. I was uh, I recall very clearly what triggered all of that those years ago because it was the East York Board of Education and I was living in East York and they went behind closed doors in June of that year and they gave themselves something like a 10% raise and um, I was the one that outed it and it 
created an organization. I actually had my cell phone for the very first time I'd been given it. I still have the number, but I'd never connected it to anything. So I did connect it and it became stop trustees over, um, over taxes or something like that. But, but the acronym was made and there was a huge revolt. And Dave Johnson was the mayor at the time who then became the education minister. So the spark then led to another couple of constituencies who found the same thing. And then Mike Harris was given the tools to do what he did. But it all started with Chairman Ken Maxted and a group of others in Gail Nyberg, who went on mm-hmm. to do food. Yep. That, that was them then, and that was the spark that led to it. Now, we don't have that now, but we do have a, a premier in a province that's willing to either consolidate or do things to large groups of people like city halls and to mayoralty power and things like that. So you may not have the spark to do it at the moment, but Dave, you raised a, a, you know, a reflecting point, and that is the government has been shown that if given – the notion they will actually move to do something which is um, extraordinary. That's the word, the word, you know, like they'll shrink city council without consultation, basically just do right. it or they will do other things. So to your point, Keith, they, you know, the history speaks to the possibility of doing it. They need a spark to do it. It's not above the government to do to do something like that if they decide that they want to do it. And they're early enough in their term that they could, and they could get away with something like that too. Well, I mean, that just takes us down the lane of, you know, eliminating the separate school boards and amalgamating them all. I mean, what what kind of redundancies are there? That's just insane. Well, and it also... I, I, don't tell me that it's a constitutional issue to have an accountant in the board that's a separate board and a public board. That's not what they meant. No, no, and I, I, I agree with that. The But the, the other issue, too, is whether or not you want to negotiate with one big group of people or whether you want to negotiate mm-hmm. on a patchwork. At least with a patchwork, you've got some blame that can go you know, in different places. So it's, it is fraught with issues, but the government under Mike Harris tried to do something along that line. And this government at this early stage could consider it. And I'm sure somebody's talking about, you know, some, some elements of this, but it's not ripe yet to do it, but it could be given the circumstances that might unfold. Just a footnote for those of you, uh, you know, playing along at home. Uh, when we said Dave Johnson was the mayor, it was the day was. when East York had its own mayor. Yes. All the municipal load. North York had a mayor, East York, Scarborough. Just right? off of Mortimer Avenue. York. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and out of the go. six or seven, we picked Mel? <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody. <laughs> That's Nobody right. like him. All right. So the report came out this past, this past week in terms of hospital um, wait times. And, you know, the, 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 the report was leaked to the media, I think, by one of the um, liberal MPPs who happens to be an eMERGE doc. And the number suggested it was an increase year over year of 53% in terms of um, wait times in the hospitals. And I thought it was interesting to see how this all played out. Keith, when they release these numbers, what well, this is a, a monthly yep. report, right? So it's not as if it's something <clears throat> really uh, nefarious. It wasn't like it was an investigative piece. But who gets to see this? Is it just the? It sounded as though it was leaked to the liberal, and who leaked it to the media. I'm I'm shocked that this is in a public document. Well, Ontario Health, the new massive entity that incorporates everything, so I don't know who reports to who and who gets a hold of a report and how far that report gets distributed within Ontario Health, which is quite the umbrella now. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that report was ever destined to be made public or whether, as you say, it's a monthly report. Uh, doctors and nurses are reporting frontline situations here. Surely to God, they know their situation. They know because they have to refer people to other hospitals. They know what's going on in their immediate surroundings. We're now seeing hospital referrals from Toronto and Hamilton to Ottawa for children. So we're, you know, they're all aware of each other's situation. So why they would try to keep this report private, I don't know. Anyway, the liberal doctor got a hold of it, uh, talked to the media about it. Um, the statistics are, are stunning. They're kind of scary. And, and especially when we, you know, we're, are we facing another COVID wave? What's that going to do to hospitals that are already, literally, the system is starting to just crumble. Uh, one of the figures there that I found that was, uh, uh, you know, this 50% uh, t- uh, waiting times longer up, patient volumes are actually down 10% mm-hmm. year over year. But this, the, the wait time, the ambulance drop offs were down 5% year over year, but the wait time to, for that ambulance to do the drop off was up 40%. 
people are being told if you're going to the, like Chio in Eastern in, uh, in Ottawa, the Children's Hospital, uh, bring your chargers, bring some stuff for the kids to do, bring some place, things for them to nap with their toys. You're getting timers now for how long your waits are going to be in, in, in emergency rooms, emergency departments if you show up there. It's insane. And, and uh, it's very, very scary, especially when you have a government, a premier and a health minister in particular insisting there's no crisis yet. And we're, you know, we're doing our best we can. Uh, no, these these are very, very scary figures. And the, the one that really stuck out for me uh, as an actual figure is that every morning at 8 a.m., there's 883 people on average sitting in an emergency department in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. you know what? Um, there's a few things on it. We were, I was struck with this even in the last 48 hours because uh, my wife and daughter were in the United States and flew back. And our daughter, who is um, in her 20s now, has had recurring ear problems since she was a kid. And there you go, a 21-year-old who's getting a you know, a really severe earache until the it bursts. And it happened the other night and after she had flown. She's got a very high pain threshold, but it's it's severe enough that you can't get a doctor at that hour. And you you in the in the quote old days before COVID, you might have gone to emergency to say, look, just get something into her so she doesn't have the pain, you know, the pain. And actually when the eardrum bursts, it it relieves a lot of the pressure. But I found myself, like probably so many others, hesitating. You know, for the first time in my life, it's kind of like, I don't know whether I can get a doctor. I don't know whether I can get a doctor appointment. And so it was until four o'clock that, that day, yesterday, that we could get one. But if I hadn't been able to, what do I do? W where do I go um, if it had been something even more severe? So for the first time in my life, I'm hesitating going to the emergency ward. And you might say, well, that's a good thing because it turned out that she was okay and she got an appointment and all that sort of stuff. But there's lots of other people who were doing so too. And from the polling that I have during COVID, there are lots of people who were putting off going in, getting treated for all kinds of medical ailments and things like that. So there is an underlying thing that's crept into our mindset now, and that is the healthcare system we knew you know, three or four years ago, as bad as it was, was still really pretty open. And now it's not. And you got to second guess yourself before you go. Secondly, what's become apparent now is when you've got a million and a half people without a doctor and you have lots of doctors who are now retiring, it's just putting more pressure on the system. The question is, where do you go? Because if you walk into a walk-in clinic, they're booked up. I mean, go to the corner of where I live and you walk in, it's kind of like, yeah, come back three days from now. Well, that, I mean, that doesn't help either. So we have a we have a doctor crisis, not just a bed crisis. The third thing is that with the government moving people out of the hospitals, that was, from my understanding, had a lot to do with the request of the hospitals themselves. I mean, the government took it on the chin that they were moving people out of there, but in fact, they need beds and they kind of have to move people out of there in order to get more people into the hospital and get them to stop lying in hallways and things like that. So that's going on. All to, all to say at the end of this is that the minister has been notably absent right from day one. The minister basically has said, look, there's no problem. We're okay. Dorothy, you know, there's not a tornado. Don't worry. Everything was going to be okay. And, and that, that is the issue. I mean, we would have had, we, we came to expect every day Christine Elliott or whoever it was was standing out there telling us how everything was and things like that. This, this is a different kind of minister. This is a, uh, a missing in action minister and they're just going to ride it out again. Maybe politic because it's early on in the, in the, um, in the mandate, but there doesn't seem to be a blueprint for moving forward. At all. There doesn't seem to be kind of like, we have a four point plan. There's nothing to give public assurance. It's just kind of like, yeah, everything's okay. Don't worry. I'll call, you know, you know we're see training doctor, more doctors. Do yeah, we're yeah. training more doctors. We're investing in healthcare people, something like that. Well, tell me the last time you got a doctor in, you know, six months that could come in and, you know, after right out of university and start practicing. Not the case. So something's going to give, especially if we have an uptick in. COVID cases as we're now seeing and we start to over leverage the ICUs and everything like that, that's where we get into some real problems. Well, here's this hospital avoidance issue it struck me yesterday when Nova Scotia reported its weekly or monthly numbers it was on COVID monthly numbers. Uh, and they said for the month of, uh, I guess it was August we got yesterday, uh, 42 people were admitted to the Halifax hospital with COVID. 
162 got COVID in the hospital when they were admitted for something else. Mm-hmm. That's so. A COVID is not only coming back; we're coming coming into the. Are we talking eighth wave? I don't even know what wave. Yeah, anyway, there's another eight. wave coming. Yeah, certainly, eight, wave eight. Yep. But the fact that you know of the 200 people in hospital with in the Halifax hospital with COVID, 160 of them got it in the hospital. That's going to keep most of us away from an emergency department as long as possible, even those of us that don't have family doctors and you know a long, long list of waiting to get one. Uh, in fact, uh, one family doctor in Nova Scotia complained. He said he complained to the hospital, "You didn't notify me that you were discharging my elderly patient." And they said, "So few patients have doctors. We we stopped looking in many cases to oh, just man. notify the doctor." The, you know, just on one final point on all of this that, and I. And I I, I agree entirely with everything you guys have said in terms of it's a staffing issue. It's not a bad issue, first of all, that we don't necessarily we, we've gone and got up front and said we have to free up all of these beds. And, you know, we 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 focus on the long term care issues and moving people into homes, whether they want to go or not. The fact of the matter is the hospitals do not have the staff capacity to deal with any of the open beds. So that's one. Agreed. thing. And, and can I just just, you know, I'll do respect to our friends in the media but there's such shitty reporting on these stories like seriously if you go back and you look at this report that was released and they got it from the liberal mpp he's the only freaking voice in the story he's the only voice in the story now it's a good voice but he's the only voice and then they just regurgitate what's in that report second thing is there's a headline this morning and i heard it on the radio Sick Kids denies claims it's transferring ICU patients to U.S. hospitals. Well, what's all this about? Now, it makes, you know, it begins to imply things are so bad, this iconic hospital, this world renowned hospital, can't handle the pressure of kids who need to be treated. That's not what the story is about. The story is about the hospital responding to a freaking tweet that claimed, apparently claimed, uh, patients were being transported to Buffalo. Now they put in the link posted on social media. They have a URL link on that phrase. So you can go to the URL. Well, I clicked on that and it takes me to Twitter because it was supposed to be there. And guess what? Deleted. The tweet's been deleted. Yeah. Yeah. Cause okay. it's wrong. Well, maybe it's wrong, but it doesn't even say who sent the tweet. What was the content of the tweet? There's no follow up in terms of saying, Hmm, there's a children's hospital in Buffalo. Why don't we phone them? Why don't we find out if anything of this happened? Why don't we phone sick then, kids? Well, they well all they did was was quote the tweet oh, from sick kids. Yeah, yeah. I'm so fucking sick of this. It, it, like again, I I I sound like the old guy, and I am. But I don't understand how this stuff gets past editors anymore. Like I just don't get it. It's such bullshit, and it's not good journalism. No, it's 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 sad, sad journalism. Uh, John Oliver did a thing on his show last week about uh, this rainbow fentanyl police scare say. that's going around. Police say, police say, rainbow fentanyl. Right. right. I saw a headline yesterday from Canada on Twitter. Police say they seize rainbow fentanyl and it's worth you know, all this. And and again, uh, and I, I saw another bust out of Hamilton. Yes, I think it was Hamilton yesterday. Anyway, and again, the police have, you know, the drugs and the gun, the one gun laying on the table. And they had the $20 bills fanned out. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> like it's. And, you know, it's just the, and the media are falling for this all the time, just rewriting press releases. I remember, uh, you know, spent the bulk of my career at the Canadian Press and Broadcast News, the wire services. And, you know, one of the rules in almost any newsroom was you rewrote the wire. You did just rip and read, as yeah. they called it. Well, let me assure you, a great many stations in our largest markets rip and read BN or CP copy every damn day. Uh, yeah. So the fact that they're now not rewriting press releases saddens me, but doesn't surprise me. My wife well, even heard it, one on the day the other. She said, I just read this yesterday. I said, I read the press release yesterday. We're hearing it on the radio. And it yeah. was like literally word for word from the press release uh, of the police. And including, you know, the word incident, uh, which is just a great word. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm rambling on. Uh, no, 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 no. But journalism. I think this is at the heart of it. Because, we're, you know, we, we get around to talking about the messaging of the minister and education or what the unions are saying. If you really look closely at it, it's just regurgitating bullshit news releases from either the minister or tweets from the union. I mean, let's actually get to the heart of the story. I, I don't know where it happens or but, it's, you know. But let's also put this in context because the three of us have 
being, I, I count myself as being in media. I'm not a journalist, but I've done this now for a long time. Um, this is way different than it was even five years ago. Those newsrooms have been absolutely decimated for two reasons. One is that sometimes the owner who may not have anything to do with media has decided they're going to gut newsrooms and, you know, make sure that they show profits to their shareholders. And as a result, it takes out a whole bunch of people who normally would be investigating these things. And we know who we're talking about, and especially in the radio world. We're all well, look those, what's going on at the Toronto Star well, but right that's, now. Okay. With Bithob and yeah, right? Right. Yeah. But then the next thing is, I mean, you look at the newspaper companies across the board and you see i mean every editor that goes into certain newspapers is i mean their first job is they got a slash or they got a burn or they decide well we're not going to publish on monday or you know maybe we're only going to publish on fridays and not on every other day you know they're they're forced to this because revenue is down not just from before but also because of the competition so the stat what i find you guys are on one side of of the microphone and i'm on the other side putting out stuff what I find is the bandwidth for reporters is basically nil. What I find Zero. from editors is yeah. that there's just a flood of stuff coming in. And I it it's it's a privilege to get your polls covered, for goodness sake, with media partners because they just don't have the people. I mean, you and I know that in the last few years, there's even stringers that they use who are university kids, you know, trying to cut their teeth in in journalism and they're getting them to write, you know, stories from their home to bring them on. So I agree that these things are not investigated, but my goodness, what a different world than it was five or ten years ago. It's just completely changed, and the bandwidth is so narrow. One can, I, can I riff off the end of this and just to, to turn into the, um, the, the Dr. Moore conversations from yesterday? Karen Moore, public health officer here in Ontario, talking about the eighth wave, and we may be looking at you know more mandates more uh, uh or sorry not mandates but more uh, requirements yeah. for yeah. masks or recommendations etc and you know even in the heart of that story the ctv news had to speak to the ministry of health to get clarification mm-hmm. on what the public health officer said weren't they in the room asking the question of the public health officer well if this and if that and if grandma had wheels she'd be a wagon <laughs> and if, right? if, if uh it's going to be a complex and difficult winter uh, well, uh-huh. thanks for that, Dr. Moore. So mask or no mask? Well, yeah, right. yeah uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, so I, the way to get the reinforcement there, you know, like just say, for goodness sakes, uh, we certainly recommend masking in all public transit and closed situations or, you know, let's just give us some basic, here's some, you know, real public health, not just we think it's a good idea and if you're at risk, none of that namby-pamby crap. All public transit, all public gatherings, over 20 people indoor, whatever. But come on, you know, it's coming back. We see this eighth wave. It's the fall. It's flu season. Kids are in school. All that stuff. It's all coming together at one time. If all, if the vector is there that we can all see it, do we need to wait to have him say, put masks on? You know, I think it's, I think it's the worst nightmare for a government to be faced with this, having reduced everything so that we're all walking around basically without care. I know that there I'm eligible for that extra shot now, just like most people. And I've, I, I just, you know, I'll get around to it. I looked at my shoppers, uh, thing that I got in the, in my in basket yesterday. And it was like, you know, take a look and see if you can get a shot. So last night I'm sitting watching a hockey game and I kind of click into it and it says, Oh my goodness, it's full up for the next three days. Try next week. And it's like, okay, well, we'll try next week. I mean, it's, whereas before, you would have been at the front of the line. In fact, I was with Steve Pakin at one point uh, in Toronto where we just kind of got there. We were like number one and number two. And now it's kind of like, yeah, you know, I'm it's you okay. I'll get to- so my sense of urgency <laughs> is down. Yeah. Sense of urgency is down when I should have my guard up. Number two, we don't have as many people in the hospital as we did before. And number three, this is a crisis waiting to happen. And you and I know that those ICU numbers are ticking up. And we know that that's going to clog emergency wards as well. So give what we have now and start to increase it. Plus, we have large scale outbreaks in long term care homes across the province. So I I agree with you, Keith, you know, like he, he was he was jumping and dancing around stuff when maybe he should have been much more affirmative. But we also don't have any public education campaigns running right now. We don't have, you know, people who are out there saying, it's coming, man, get out there, do this sort of stuff. It's like, 
okay, we had 30,000 out yesterday or 80,000 getting their shots. You know, hopefully we'll get more today. Like that's the sense of urgency is just not there. So I, it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next 30 days. That will be the beginning of the major crunch going forward. And it's going to affect not just people getting help for COVID, but it's going to be everything else that starts to block up again. Well, I want to, I want to kind of take a step back at some point. I'd be curious. I don't even know if this falls in your in your bailiwick, John, but there's got to be something in here around decision fatigue where we have just kind of hit the wall on the ability or the, the even the inclination to have to deal with a decision anymore, given what we've gone through with, with COVID. Just before we go, I, I, we talked about this on the daily podcast, Now and Next, that Aaron and I do, but I really do want to get uh, your take whether or not uh, Danielle Smith... Uh, deserves a mulligan on this. The community that faced the most restrictions on their freedoms in the last year were those who made a choice not to be vaccinated. I don't think I've ever experienced a situation in my lifetime where a person was fired from their job or not allowed to watch their kids play hockey or not allowed to go visit a loved one in long-term care or hospital or not allowed to go get on a plane to either go across the country to see family or even travel across the border. So they have been the most discriminated against group that I've ever witnessed in my lifetime. That's a pretty extreme level of discrimination that we have seen. I don't take away any of the discrimination that I've seen in those other groups that you mentioned, but this has been an extraordinary time in the last uh, year in particular. And I want people to know that I find that unacceptable, that we are not going to create a segregated society on the basis of a, of a medical choice. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many mixed messages in there. Aaron and I already had a, our, our kick at it, but uh, John? Well, I'm going to agree with her. And I'm going to agree with her as a 65-year-old guy um, who, you know, was not around to see people excluded from lives or being fired or anything. Like, I, I know that there are other groups within our society um, even even gay and lesbian, to which that would have been criminalized in my lifetime, um, and there would have been consequences. I know that there's religious intolerance, but not in this country have I ever witnessed exactly what she said. Tick the boxes. You can't get on a plane. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do all these other sort of things. So I think it's an accurate statement. Within her lifetime and within mine, I've never seen that. And we talked about the potential consequences of that. You can't take... 10% of the entire population of this country, the core, you, you remember me saying this, the core of, of the population of Toronto and Montreal all together and just squish them into a box and have no way of mediating or mitigating what's going on. You may disagree with them. You may have problems with them. You may have all those sort of things, but you're going to get pushback and consequence to all of that. So she doesn't just represent a constituency. She represents a time when, when people were restricted, massively fired, couldn't send their kids to school, all that. So that is a fact. The, the question was, was it, the real question is, was it reasonable at the time? And that's the- And was it discrimination? And, and, There's well, a no, huge but, difference in the use of that word. It's a consequence. It's not discrimination. Well, no, 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 no. It's a you're consequence making, you're of making, their actions. Yeah but, yeah, but it doesn't, see, this is the argument that I had with many of my friends at the time when they would be at the table and I'd say, well, what are you going to do with them? Well, send them to jail, send them to this, send them to that. I mean, you're dealing with- 4.5 million people in this country, not a handful, not a few. And they have lot, and there was, there's no mitigation. There's nothing. There was no table to go to. And that's why you ended up with everybody going to Ottawa and, and doing what they did. That's from the polling. There's 30% of the people in this country who actually agreed with those people in terms of how they went about protesting. So we could have a whole other podcast on this, but the, 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 the issue is, you cannot simply segregate people and put them in a corner and not expect some kind of consequence. And you can't. Okay. The next thing she's going to demand is a truth and reconciliation day for the. No, she's not. And that I was mean, a waste. Seriously. And that was a waste of. And that was. And and the commission on on uh, missing Aboriginal women. I mean, it may have been a nice kind of catharsis, but we never found out the answer as to why that was happening and things like that. Look, we can we we can go after her for whatever it was. You asked my opinion. My opinion was, I yep. think factually, she's right. I cannot recall in my lifetime any uh, other group discriminated against or actioned against in that way with no out. I mean, just from, you know, 
It went to the court process. Everybody said that it's all legal. They can do all these sort of things. It doesn't take away the social circumstance that when you do that, you are going to have consequence. And she's basically saying, look, I'm not going to do that again. There's got to be a way of doing this better. It's a, it was a purely political statement. She knew what she was doing. Uh, she's in a position. She wants to get some uh, positive ink in her mind for herself. And quite frankly, uh, to the people that she's trying to appeal to to vote for her in the future, uh, I don't think it would have hurt her in the slightest. Um, I, I think I would have advised against such language. Uh, there, these were, you know, I think in most Canadians, the 90% that did line up to get our shots when we were asked to voluntarily to do something right for the public good. Uh, there, was, there was some anger at that other 10%, and there's some anger at the 10% for being told what to do. Well, you were asked to do this, or there was consequences. They did not like the consequences. To John's point, the consequences were more severe than most things we've seen in our lifetime. Uh, but perhaps, you know, when you're dealing with an unprecedented pandemic to that degree, I don't know what you do with the 10% that don't want to do what we all, the rest of us consider as the greater good. I didn't want to line up and get shots. I got sick for a few days every time. I hated it. But I did it, uh, and I'll go get that fourth one when I can get in there. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's the right thing to do. I get a flu shot as well. I'm of that age bracket that I should do it. But these are things that, you know, we're doing voluntarily. I guess mandating it pushed 10% of the people just too hard, too far. But I don't know what the resolution is other than these are consequences, not discrimination. All right, let me just let me just leave it here because I what I do want to say and just close the circle on all of this. What is interesting most to me is that this did not come up really in the media in terms of people in the room challenging her at the time on the language that she used. It showed up the next day when there was a written statement from the premier's office that you know the premier did not pen. You know that. So <laughs> this is how it was all how it was all played out. Um and you know I can ima- only imagine that here was the the uh the meeting after Daniel Smith met the uh, met the media. In stage one, we say nothing is going to happen. Stage two, we say something <laughs> may be going to happen, but we should do nothing about it. In stage three, we say that maybe we should do something about it, but there's nothing we can do. <laughs> stage four, we say maybe there was something we could have done, but it's too late. Now. <laughs> that just never gets old. <laughs> nope. And remember, not least, not least, the, the the numbers were out today in Alberta, and not least still leads. And uh, in fact, yeah, yeah, asked sure. yeah. Daniel Smith for a premier. So that's another fight uh, today, uh, you know, uh, projecting <laughs> forward to the future. Indeed. A little longer than usual, but lots of good stuff to talk about. Thanks to Keith the Leslie and John Wright. I'm Dave Trafford, and this is On the Ledge, your Ontario politics podcast. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.